any questions, I'll periodically hop back and forth. If you guys shoot something in the Telegram chat, if you're in it, uh, that'll ding on my phone. I can't really switch through tabs while on this webinar when I'm in the charts. I can, but I'll just you know pop back and forth um, between the screen and the webinar. The webinar doesn't really notify me when I get a message in the webinar, but uh, I'll definitely be popping back and forth for any questions. But I'm just going to go, like I said, this is going to be an unscripted webinar all about finding high probability trades. So really it's going to be a broad topic on all different aspects of trading. Um, I wrote a little note board here a couple minutes before <laughs> this opened. Just different um, aspects of trading that I use to put together to find these high probability trades. And um, yeah, it is Beatrix. Give me one sec here. I'll get you the invite. Um, basically, I will... Uh, what's up, Sivan? How's it going, man? Um, yeah, so basically, I'll just be touching on all these different you know, aspects of trading that I use to find trades. Um, again, I'm just going to be going non off the script. I'm just going to hop into some charts and just go over some stuff with you guys and just quickly break down uh, the different analysis tools and as aspects that I use. Uh, so any questions you guys have, throw it in here. I'll pop back and forth um, to check on them. But I'm just going to kind of roll into this here and see as we go. Um, let me see here. I actually got a... Share my screen. Pop this camera off. Microphone. Check one, two. All right. Everybody, let me know that you can hear me and see my screen real quick, please, and I'll move on. All right. Thanks, Clayton, John. All right. So for any of you guys who joined a little late, I'm going to hop into some charts here and basically just go off the script. I'm not going by anything other than um, just what I use and what's off the top of the head. I'm, I'm, I called this webinar Finding High Probability Trades. Because essentially what I'm going to do is just break down how I find setups, what I look for in trades, um, how I go about identifying them, different aspects that I use to uh, really just identify those trades. So one of the, if you guys watch my videos or if you're in my training or anything, there's a lot of different topics that I preach about. One of the biggest things that I did that helped change my game, um, that was probably the I don't like saying the biggest game changer because I've had a lot of game changing moments in Forex, but one of the biggest ones was when I cut back on my trading. When I started to, and it took a long time to get to that point, trust me, um, even when I had an exact trading plan written down, that, that there were still a lot of trades that I took that weren't following it. Um, and the more precise of a trading plan you get, the less frequently you'll trade. And the less frequently you trade means you're taking typically more high probability setups because there's more factors that need to line up before that trade is there. So um, the more disciplined I became with following my structure and my set of rules, no matter what your set of rules are, you just need a set of rules, especially early on trading. So um, that set will change dramatically as you progress, as you see what you do and don't like, what doesn't, doesn't work. But just following a set of rules and being disciplined to that set is literally half the battle. Um, so even after doing that for a while, I still took me a while before I started to limit my trading to only following that and not taking anything outside of that. And then I was able to adjust the strategy and uh, essentially what it all boils down to is finding these trades that have the highest probability, but based off of something that you've actually done and tested before, right? So the longer you trade something, the longer you've tested it because you have taken multiple trades using the same um, whatever your factors are, your confirmations, and you've been able to test it and see over X amount of trades how it performs. Um, but what we are really testing is a series of probabilities. Trading is all about probability, right? It's all about nothing is certain, nothing's for sure. You want to line up as many factors as you can to have the highest probability of success possible. 
And there are a number of different things from trend direction to support and resistance to Fibonacci trend lines, uh, chart patterns, candlestick patterns, a number of different things. You can find an indicator for anything nowadays. You can find a tool for anything nowadays. So what ultimately we want to be able to do as traders is find a trade that lines up as many probabilities as you can to make a perfect setup. Now, I don't mean you want 17 indicators on your chart and you can barely see the candles, but there's 19 oscillators on the bottom of your chart. Um, that's not what I mean by high probability and a lot of factors lining up. What I mean by that is not only do you have a set plan of action, but that plan of action has multiple confirmations that line up to let you know when a trade is ready to be triggered, right? So if you're a support and resistance trader, you're not going to trade just based off of a support or resistance zone breaking or holding. That's not enough to be a trading strategy. You can't just sell every time price hits a major resistance on the daily, weekly, monthly chart. You can't just buy every time you hit a major support zone, right? You can't just buy every time you tap an uptrend line. There has to be multiple layers to your analysis to give you a high probability that your trade is going to work out. Now there's always going to be losing trades, losing streaks, losing days, losing weeks, losing months. Um, that stuff can happen. And it's stuff that you can't really dwell on and let affect your mentality, especially early on. You're gonna probably develop a system at some point or already have, make a trading plan, trade it 10 trades, lose six of them and immediately give up and move on to something different when really you could have been making a lot of errors on those trades or that trading strategy could have just been in a little slump there. It could have performed better. Maybe a risk to reward wasn't nearly as good. Maybe those four winners could have been three times the size of those six losers. That's a winning trading plan, right? So um, you really need to find a set of probabilities, a set of confirmations, a set of analysis that lines up and execute it constantly and never ever deviate from it, ever. You need to journal these results. You need to take pictures of the charts. You need to take notes and you need to have a checklist before every trade you make so that you manually go through and check every single aspect of your plan is present and there in every trade. And if there's any part of your trading plan that's not there that you're like fudging or you're like, oh, well, it's close enough to the 50% fib level or all oh, that, that, that could be considered a reversal candlestick pattern, but it's not one of the ones on my plan. That immediately is something you're going to do wrong for a while, but you need to start focusing on and weeding out. And if you journal, you are you lose the trade, then you can go back and be like, oh, well, you see, this confirmation wasn't totally there and I forced the trade, right? So you're not following this trading strategy. So um, I'm going to veer off a lot in this webinar into different things, but that's kind of what I like to do with these. I like to kind of freestyle and go off. So if anybody has things along the way, I'll keep periodically checking back. But um. I'm going to hop into now the probabilities. So to determine how you're going to build a trading plan and uh, how you're going to find these setups, what you're going to use, I'm a technical analysis trader. I'm not going to try to teach you methods or trading strategies that I don't follow. Um, that's I have no place to do that. All the strategies that I use and trade, I've tested myself. Thousands of simulator trades, thousands of demo trades, thousands of live trades. Um, I've traded for multiple different trading companies. For any of you here that's new to my webinars that don't know me, so I should have done this at the beginning. My bad, guys. Um, I've been trading Forex for six years. I've been trading professionally for over two. I do professional analysis for T3 trading live. Um, I've worked with T3. I've worked with Maverick. I've worked with a number of different professional foreign currency trading companies, which is uh, proprietary trading is what I've done. Essentially, you trade for a company um, they usually have a pretty extensive training and qualification program. Some of them allocate you funds immediately. Uh, but basically you trade company money and keep a percentage of the profits. You have to maintain profitability. You have to prove your, your worth. You have to put up some of your own capital as risk. There's a lot that goes into it, but I've traded professionally for multiple different firms. Um, and I've been trading for a long time. I am a trend trader by nature. Uh, that is what essentially 99% of my trades are. And, um, I have a training program that some of you in here are part of where I teach only the strategies that I've used, that I've tested, that I've proven. Um, and 
everything I'm going to be going over in here is what I personally do, what I personally have found successful, and what I personally have tested and practiced in the markets live day, day in and day out. So I'm not going to sit here and try to teach you strategies that aren't mine. I'm not going to try teaching you anything I haven't proven and tested myself. I am a swing trader in the direction of the trend. I'm not going to teach you intraday scalping. I'm not going to teach you counter trend reversal trades, even though I do have some very particular setups that could occur. Um, I'm only going to teach you stuff that I've done and I use. So for our high probability trades, um, there are a number of different factors that I use to identify something that's high probability. And essentially what you want to do is I have, if you can see my full view here, which I believe you can, I have trading view. I use trading view and um, I have a watch list here of the 28 most common currency pairs, the major eight pairs, dollar, euro, pound, CAD, yen, franc, uh, Aussie, New Zealand, and all their crosses, right? Makes up 28 pairs. That's, that's what I analyze. Um, that's where I look for trades on. And because I'm a trend trader, my first filter with identifying a high probability trade is I'm going to look in the direction of the trend. I have tools I've developed to determine a strong trend. I have market structure, moving averages, support resistance, trend lines, and all that help determine the direction of a trend. But the first thing I do is narrow that list down to the top trending pairs because I only want to be in not only trending pairs, but strong trending pairs. So looking at this chart here, I'm not trading necessarily in this zone. I'm not trading in this zone. I'm trading in this zone, right? I'm trading in this zone. Okay, so that's what I mean by strong trending pairs. I want to be looking for pairs that are moving in the same direction over a given period of time in strong moves, right? Um, so just by looking back here, I'm looking short all along here, all along here. I might even be long in here once we're up into this range and it's established trend. So uh, I'm establishing and determining and trading in the direction of a trend, right? I'm identifying support and resistance. So just to throw a few lines on here. I'm going to be identifying areas where the market has touched and reacted to, right? It's failed to pass. Just by looking at this chart, I can see here, we have one, two, three, four, and then we finally broke it and it was a strong break, right? That's another thing that I teach as a, as a key impact on determining strong support and resistance levels is, did it take a big candle to break it? That's a very big candle, right? That took a big candle to break. Um, just by looking at this chart, I can see, okay, here's a zone, right? Respected it here, broke through, support, 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 strong break, resistance, strong break, support, support, support. See, that's another support resistance. Now, how does support and resistance help me as a trend trader? There's two different ways you can trade a trend. You can trade a trend on a pullback. This is in an uptrend, right? Let me just redo this real quick. So we have an uptrend making higher highs, higher lows, higher high higher low on a higher low which is going to be our pullback I'm looking for long opportunities and then I'm going long so if I'm trading pullbacks in an uptrend what I'm going to be looking for is strong areas of support now ideally what these will look like is respecting market structure we have a higher high higher low higher high higher low higher high and what did the higher low do came back to touch the higher high that was broken prior. So this will be ideal as resistance broken now acting as support, right? That's another key characteristic of support and resistance. When broken, it swaps its role. So think about it as you're going through a building, right? You're breaking through the ceiling, that's resistance. Once you're through it, now you're up on the next floor. What was, was resistance is now below you and it's support. So that's how these levels work. So if I'm in an uptrend, I'm going to be identifying in pullbacks support that price is bouncing back to. And then you can use resistance as target levels, right? If this was your resistance, you entered short long here, you could have your target be up here at this next level. Um, the other way to trade trends 
if you're getting higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. Another way to trade the trend is with market structure breaking out, right? So let's say this was resistance. Next time price comes up to it, you want to trade long once it breaks that resistance. This can be your entry long. It broke into new territory above the resistance and you go long and then maybe you ride the wave, right? So when you're trading breakouts in an uptrend, resistance is going to be what you want to watch for a breakout, right? So you want to watch for the resistance to be broken. And then again, you can use support for your stop losses, a um, number of different things, but support and resistance is another extremely critical aspect to, I believe, anybody's trading. I don't think there's a trader, technical at least, there's probably still a very select few, but there's probably still some purely fundamental traders that won't even look at a technical analysis chart. Um, it's pretty ignorant, in my opinion, someone that would trade like that. But there are, you know, those technical analysis is a, is a newer form of trading. I mean, it's been around forever, but it hasn't been nearly as popular as it's been nowadays. If you told a, fun, a, a trader 100 years ago or 70 years ago or 50 years ago that uh, you were purely a technical trader, or even 20 years ago, they probably would have laughed at you. Um, nowadays, you'd laugh if you heard somebody just traded fundamentals without even peeping a chart. So um, anybody who trades technical analysis, anybody is going to be using support and resistance. That's just a given. And now support and resistance has a number of different shapes and forms. Your standard horizontal support and resistance is what I was just going over. That's going to be your uh, price points that appear horizontally across the chart, right? Now, um, there's support and resistance that's dynamic, like these moving averages. As they move, they can act as support and resistance. If you look at the 200, it is always my favorite example. Very strong. Every time price touches it in here, you can see it's reacting to it, right? So moving averages can act as support and resistance. Within an uptrend, you can see uh, sometimes 50 SMA acts, sometimes 20 SMA acts, sometimes the dynamic zone between the two can be. Um, you've got trend lines. They are going to be a diagonal area of support and resistance. That's going to act as support. And if you had an upward trend channel on this one, it would be acting as resistance. Fibonacci levels act as support and resistance. Pivot points act as support and resistance. Uh, there's a number of supply and demand zones can be support and resistance in a kind of different way. Um, there's a number of different aspects of this um, support and resistance concept that can be applied to different uh, things on the chart. But your typical horizontally applied textbook support and resistance is going to be one of the essential, what I think every single trader should have in their trading plan. All right. Um, and then aside from your horizontal support and resistance, we've got market structure, which if you guys follow my analysis or take my, if you take my course, you get the, the lessons on it. But if you follow my analysis, market structure is going to be, let's say we're in an uptrend. We've set a higher high, come back, set a higher low. We come up, set a higher high, come back, set a higher low, come up, set a higher high, Come back to the higher low. And what this is, is market respecting a structured flow, right? So we've got this high was established. Price came back, established this low. Price came up, broke that high, set a new high up here, came back, didn't quite touch that low, made a new low, right? Higher high, higher low. Higher high broke the prior higher high, pulled back, set a new higher low, higher than the prior low. Right? Then what did it do? Here's the prior high, came up, broke the prior high, set a new higher high, pulled back. This is what we want to see right here. Right? Market structure here, all the way across. We had a resistance broken, pulled back to respect right on resistance before going to set a new higher high. Right? That is picture perfect market structure. Those are the types of setups we look for and want to find. Um, and, and those are going to be the ones where you have the most probability in your favor, right? So market structure, yeah, as you change with trends, it changes. I'm not going to dive into any of these one topics too detailed, as I said. Um, but market structure is another aspect, right? You want to see if price is setting higher highs and higher lows. We're in an uptrend. Right? So, um, 
this is just another tool you need to apply to have that um, come on, high probability trade that we're talking about, right? So um, you got support and resistance, you got market structure, you got the direction of the trend, which is the my first and foremost, right? Then I want to identify a trend that's at a key level or that's pulled back to a key level, all right? Then we have trend lines, right? We have, we have uh, market structure, support and resistance, trend direction, trend lines. When we're in an uptrend, we want to connect the swing lows that price is making in an uptrend. And there's a number of different trend lines you can draw in different applications for trend lines. There's trend lines that are used to draw patterns. So you've got top and bottom trend line of a falling wedge, right? You've got um, trend lines that, that guide price in an uptrend and a downtrend, right? So you've got upper and lower trend lines in this upward trend channel. You've got counter trend lines. Dropping it down to a four hour chart, we've got trend lines in the opposite direction of the trend. You can watch for breaks in the direction of the trend. You've got weekly trend lines like you could see this could be, which is also a daily trend line, but you got a smaller daily trend line here, which all can add together and line up to help your trades. And then here you've got a counter trend line you can draw across the tops here, right? So um, trend lines are another tool. Trend lines have another unique aspect like with support and resistance horizontally, where once broken, it can now act as a trend line support or resistance, the opposite of what it was. So this trend line was resistance. This is a beautiful counter trend line, broken. Now we can look for this trend line to act as support. It pulled back, tapped it. What did it do? Act as support. And it kept going, right? Um, and that can happen when trends reverse. Let's see if we can find one here. Like this was, price was moving bottom left to top right. So we're moving upwards. We could have drawn a trend line there. And look kind of tapped it there, but it came all the way up to touch it here and then it fell off, right? So um, trend lines can be broken and retested with or against the trend. They can be drawn against the trend. They can be drawn with the trend. They can guide channels of price. They can create chart patterns. Um, trend lines have a number of different uses as well. And they are another tool that, you know, are essential to have. I don't particularly or do one of my trading styles so my strategy has a diff couple different a uh, few different setups that I look for and they're very high probability setups so I could go um, last week no the week before last week anyone who's in core effects knows I didn't have a single trade that week you know nothing triggered which is I have a few different setups that I look for and a whole week went by without a single one of them triggering and I didn't I didn't place a trade and I was fine with it and I'll tell you what it took a long time to be that way it took a long time it took a lot of lost money a lot of broken keyboards a lot of uh, ripping my hair out to be honest with you there were times when I could have just thrown my computer into the wall and never touched Forex again but yeah I had too much passion for it I had too much love for it but um, that's just how high probability setups should be. They shouldn't, if they were happening constantly, they wouldn't be high probability. You know, they would be high frequency. So if you want a high probability trading strategy, it's gotta be something that doesn't happen too often, but when it does, it has a higher chance of working in your favor. And I don't have a trading style that has an 80, 90% accuracy. I go for anywhere from 50 to 75% accuracy. But those winning trades are accurate enough to win two times the size of when they lose. So that's where the accuracy and the probability comes in. There's a lot of people that try to brag about 80, 70, 80, 90 percent um, win ratio. But I'll guarantee you their wins aren't bigger than their losses. Might even be a negative trader. And that could be done with that win trade, win style, because you take a small win and you're out. But then you take a big loss and five small wins are gone. So um, that's how my strategy is developed. And um, so back to trend lines. They are another tool that I don't personally 
except for one of my styles. I don't personally have them as a requirement for my trading strategy. So I will analyze trends, trend lines, and I will use them and uh, always be aware of them and help them either deter me away from a trade or be more inclined to take one. But it's not one of my necessary factors. I have necessary factors and then additional probability factors. And my necessary factors on one of my setups is definitely a trend line. It's an hourly counter trend line break. But it's not mandatory on my other setups. The purpose of me telling you that is find the tools that you'd like. Support and resistance, I don't care if you like it or don't like it. It needs to be in your plan. If you don't like support and resistance, then I don't know if technical analysis is really right for you. Because almost every tool there is is based off support and resistance. Um, but um, support and resistance, if you don't like it, then you have it be an essential part of your plan, but you don't... I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer to not like support and resistance. But um, if you don't like moving averages all that much, have it be a small part of your plan, help you determine the trend direction, or don't even include it. If you never saw success with Fibonacci, don't use it. Either practice it more and test it extensively so that you can really see if it works or not, because I've extens extensively tested it, and you can look at any chart and see that the levels are pretty apparent. Um, but if you don't like it, don't use it. That's the beauty of trading, and that's the disaster of trading. Everybody trades so differently, and everybody's mental makeup is so differently. The way your human instincts are and the way you've been programmed your entire life, you're not going to change for trading. So if you are a very, very impatient trader and you can't hold, if you're an impatient human and you can't do anything that requires much patience, if you can't sit there and um, put together a, a piece of furniture you just bought at the store, um, if you can't buy a stock that you think is going to be awesome in five years and hold it for longer than a few days, um, if you can't do anything, you're not going to be able to get yourself to be a swing or position trader. You're not going to. And if you try to, even though that's not your mental makeup, you're just going to hurt yourself. You're just tying a hand behind your back before you even get in the ring. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is to find your tools and analysis that you like and that fit you and build your plan that way. Trend lines I like, but I don't live by them. I think trend lines are one of those very objective, uh, subjective, sorry, um, tools that everybody can use differently. Like, I like to draw them as zones, and that's what really they should be drawn as. Um, not exact wicks, not exact candles, not exact line chart only. Um, I think that's all kind of baloney, people trying to overanalyze and overcomplicate things. Trend lines are a zone. They can be barely tapped. They can be slightly broken and then a wick forms and it's not. Um, but I don't think that they are exact points because nothing in trading is exactly um, consistent or you know reoccurring exactly the same. Everything is going to occur differently. So I don't think trend lines should be drawn the same. Um, moving on, there's uh, candlestick patterns. Another tool that you can use to identify high probability trades. If you are a trend trader like myself and you trade pullbacks, I have a, one of my trading styles is very heavily based off of uh, candlestick reversal patterns. That's actually the trigger, the final straw that I need to enter. So if I am a pullback trader and I, let's go back to our example down here where we had market structure respected, right? Price set a higher high, higher low, higher high, came back to retest structure, right? One entry could have been on, well, I wait for price to move and then make a deep pullback like this right here. I won't just trade immediately, quick little tap. Um, so if we have a multi-day pullback like we have right here, a trigger could be this bullish engulfing candle. It's bigger than the prior two days, three days, right? It's bigger than the prior three candles. It engulfs price. It shows a burst of momentum. Buyers came in because they liked this price and took it long. And look, you could have wrote it up. So um, for my style of trading, I like to identify candlestick reversal patterns in the direction of the trend off of support. 
maybe off a trend line, maybe off an SMA, maybe off Fibonacci level, right? So um, candlestick patterns can be very critical. Another thing you can use a candlestick pattern for is maybe exiting a trade or deterring away from a trade. Maybe you're in long on this higher low. Price comes up here and we get this bearish engulfing off a of 200 SMA after this long move. That might be where you say, you know what? I don't like the bearish momentum that's taken over. I'm going to cut my wins short here and exit the trade. So you can really get as creative as you want with using these tools. And there are really so many different ways to make money in these markets. Um, you need to find the way that works for you. And the only way you're really going to do that is by getting out there and trying and testing. Um, and really just finding what you like, what works for you. And I promise you, if you develop a strategy and start following it, even if it's a random strategy you put together right now, if you follow that perfectly and do not deviate from it or take a single trade outside of it and execute that trade, I guarantee you your trading will look at least a big step forward better than the way your trading's looked. I guarantee it. Even just following something that's in stone that, you know, like I said, you can't just buy when support is tapped. You can't just sell when uh, support is broken. Um, I'm talking an actual strategy. I teach strategies in my course and I show my exact strategies to my students. So I can't go and show you guys exactly how I trade. That wouldn't be fair. But I can show you guys some of the factors I use and how I use them. Um, chart patterns. Another great thing you can use. Um, the way I can use chart patterns as a trend trader is, let's say we're in a bullish trend here and we get this oops, flag pattern. That's a chart pattern. Now I can look for a breakout long at the top of this flag. I can use a flag pole as a target in the future. I can... Um, you know, use a break and retest of that trend line. I can even enter the flag pattern long on the touch to the bottom of the flag. There's a number of different ways you can trade them, um, but chart patterns can be helpful. I remember, and anyone that follows me remembers this head and shoulder for me, because we caught this short right here. Market structure was broken. We set a lower low, lower high, got in on the lower high, rode it to the new lower low, got out down here. Great trade based off a chart pattern. Not only but that was what was one of the additional factors that we um, liked with the trade. You've got a triple top. This could also be a head and shoulders, but also kind of be a triple top. See, you got failed break it, failed to break it, failed to break it, rolled over, right? So um, chart patterns are another good tool that you can use to help find high probability trade setups. Fibonacci, how you use Fibonacci in a trend, um, let's say we're in this uptrend, we got the swing low to the swing high. So just to show you guys what I'm doing here, if I determined we're in an uptrend, price is setting higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows to determine an area of Fibonacci is basically going to be, um, a point on the chart where you think price is likely to pull back or retrace to within a trend bounce off of and then continue in the direction of the trend. Now they can be used for stop losses, take profits, um, trade triggers to enter trades. They can be used to deter you out of them. They can be used to determine the end of a trend, the beginning of a trend, the strength of a trend. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can use these, but how I use them and how they're, they're properly used in a trend is you got a swing low, use the wicks for Fibonacci, to a swing high. You draw, drag, and drop it. And now what we're looking for is what point in this pullback do we want to now enter long to try to catch the next impulsive leg of this trend, right? So you've got impulse, correction, impulse, correction, impulse, correction, impulse, correction. And impulses are what trend traders want to trade. That's an Elliott Wave tool, another thing you can use. But um, impulses are what we want to move what we want to trade. They're typically going to be bigger and more sustained than corrections. And um, 
they're going to be more frequent. And a lot of times they're stronger moving, as you can see right here. And right here. And right here. And this gap right here. So um, Fibonacci can be used to help identify these pullbacks, right? So these pullbacks are getting higher and higher probability. Okay, we determined a trend. We found an area that was support in the past and is now support again. We've got a, um, let's just say price had a trend line already existing here. We've got a trend line. Now we throw a Fibonacci tool. We've got a Fibonacci bounce. And look here, we've got a bullish engulfing candle. Add those all up together, you've got a high probability setup. You got a trend line, you got support and resistance, you got trend direction, you got uh, 200 SMA, you got a bullish engulfing, you got a 618 Fibonacci level. Um, you're starting to see what a high probability trade looks like. Lining up all these tools, lining up all these factors. Um, then you have moving averages, which I've kind of touched on in here. I like using them for support and resistance. I like using them for trend direction. I like using them for trailing stops. I like using them for um, stop losses. I like using them for support and resistance. I love moving averages, and I use the simple moving averages. I use the 20, the 50, and the 200. I don't use them because they're anything golden. I use them just because they're the most commonly used. From all my experience with trading, most traders professionally use them. And with all these tools, we want the more people doing something. The, so these markets all respond to the human beings trading them. Maybe they respond to the algorithmic computers banks used to trade them to. But guess what? That computer was made by a human, programmed by a human, and controlled by a human. So they're looking for the same things a human would. So... Um, I want to be trading things that more human eyes are trading and reacting to, right? Like everybody, all these courses and teachers and stuff always say you want to be trading in the direction of the big banks. I know how to trade the direction of the big banks. I know when they're buying. I know when they're selling. If you use the commonly traded tools, if you use the 618, 382, 50% Fibonacci levels, I have them highlighted in colors here. Those are the most commonly used, aka most likely to work. 50 100, 200, those are some of the most commonly used moving averages. So they're going to be most likely um, responding the most. I use simple moving average. There's no real plus or minus versus the exponential moving average. Um, they're just calculated differently. I've always used the, moving, the simple moving average, so that's what I've gotten used to. That's what I'm used to, how price responds to, how to use it how my, that my, my trading strategies have been tested and proven using the SMAs, 20, 50, and 200. So that's what I use. You could love the 10, 15, and 30. That's fine. Just use it, test it, and prove it. And then that, that moving average works perfect for you, right? So I use the 20, 50, 200, and I use it as well. I like moving average crossovers. If I've got a pullback and a trend, I've got a counter trend line broken, Maybe I wait to go long when we get the moving averages to cross back over, right? When I get the 20 crosses under the 50, that's a bearish moving average cross. But when it crosses back above the 50, that's bullish. Maybe that's my trigger to enter this. Maybe I need that to line up with a couple other things. Now we're getting more and more high probable, right? Um, aside from moving averages, we have supply and demand. That's another thing that's uh, one of those um, highly questionable tools that I like to use, but um, a lot of the reason I like to use it is because a lot of other traders are watching these zones too. Um, but basically when you have in an uptrend, a demand zone is created when you have a rally, a push, a correction, and then a push. That strong push away creates a demand zone, right? There's demand in here for buyers and if price comes back to tap this, there's a chance that it will respect it again. Um, Supply zones created when you have a strong move away from um, like a resistance. I like supply zones in, in downtrends, but there could be a supply zone, right? We've got a... So a supply zone um, is going to be a drop, rally, drop, right? So you got a drop, a rally, and then a drop, and then you got a supply zone. Now a supply zone, I, I draw the wick to the candle body so you can see um, where they are. And like if I was drawing this one, I would do it like this. 
and you can see both of them were respected. Those are massive zones because of that wick, but um, supply and demand. That's another tool that you can use to help identify high probability trades. Supply and demand aren't like support and resistance in the sense that, um, you know, if this was my supply level, once it's broken, it's demand zone. Um, that's just basic support and resistance. But uh, supply and demand zone, I look for the first or second touch to a zone, and I look for a bounce off of it. If I'm in an uptrend, I get a deep pullback. Let's say I get a pullback and this was a strong move and it came back to retouch it again without breaking structure, then maybe that's a long opportunity and I get in there. Um, but supply and demand is another thing that can be used to determine um, you know, what high probability trades. Now, aside from all this price action stuff, there's, there's a lot of different price action tools. I like just naked price action, all these things I'm going over with you here. There's um, oscillators. You know, your RSI, you could look for divergence. I remember when we got this triple top here. We had the double top first, looking like that. We had divergence here. Higher highs being made here. Lower highs being made there. Momentum disagreeing with price action. Divergence. The chance of a reversal. That could be something you use. I got down here my average true range. This stupid chart would let me move it up. Average true range. Right? This is another tool. So what this is telling me right here is the euro dollar moves an average of 82 pips a day based off the last 50 days. I set my ATR to a 50 period ATR. So what it does is it takes the last 50 periods, depending on the chart you're on. This is a daily chart, so it takes the last 50 days. Divides the, adds up all the average pip moves, divides it by 50, and gets you an average that it moves. Um, sorry, that that's not how it's calculated. It's actually calculated with like the high minus close determining whatever. It's a it's a highly um, mathematical calculation, just like all these indicators are. But essentially, what it's doing is taking a, a mathematical equation and determining the average pip move, the average range that this pair moves in, in a given time period. I set it at the 50 period, and this is the daily chart. So over the last 50 days, it moves about 82 pips per day. So um, that's something I use to set my stop losses and targets. If I'm trading this daily chart, right, and I'm going long, if I set a 40 pip stop loss based off my analysis on the daily chart, half of an average day's move is gonna kick me out of that trade. So I probably want a trade that can last longer than the normal volatility, right? I don't wanna be kicked out on just a normal daily volatility. I want my trade to have room to grow and to perform to the extent of I, that I analyzed it with. So if I have a daily chart with a 82 pip ATR, I'm gonna double that ATR, right? I'm gonna look for 164 pip trade. Uh, stop loss. Um, that's just an example, right? I'm not trading 160 pip stop losses on the daily, but that's just an example. Um, there's a number of different secondary indicators. Your MACD, your stochastics, your uh, RSIs, your Bollinger Bands, parabolic SARS. There's a ton of different ones. In my course, I go over a lot of different ones and how they can be used. There's a bunch of different ways to use them, and each of them has sometimes different uses. There's oversold and overbought conditions you can use to help complement breakouts. There's divergences that can help complement intertrend continuations or reversals. There's um, moving average cross uh, MACD. You can you can use the crossover for the buy and sell signals. You can use a number of different methods for secondary indicators. Secondary indicators are secondary because they are simply calculating indicators based off what price is showing us and telling us. So. Um, all your, move, all your secondary indicators are going to be calculating some kind of formula with price to determine a um, value or an oscillator or a line or something to help you um, look for some kind of trigger or so. But it's all based off price. So secondary indicators to me are secondary. They have their uses. Yes. It's trailing stop losses exiting trades, looking for take profits, a trigger to get in a trade with a crossover, a trigger to get in a breakout with a break into oversold or overbought, 
Um, there's different things you can rely on them for, but I would be very limited to what I use them for and focus specifically on price action, especially early on. Um, and then there's a couple other factors that I include into high probability trades that not all traders, especially beginners, notice. Um, trading sessions. With my strategy and how I've tested it, um, I'll get to these questions in one sec. With my strategy and how I've tested it, I'm not trading my setup if it occurs at a random time. I'm trading my setup when it occurs in a high liquidity um, trading session. I'm looking for the London Open. I'm looking for the U.S. Open. Perfect example was, uh, I think it was Josh. Today, um, in CoreFX, I had a pending order for dollar pound. I'll go to it. I had a pending order for dollar pound. On this pullback, I had a pending long. Right? I'm not going to go over exact details of where it was because that's not fair to my students. Um, I had a buy stop, and if it didn't trigger before 11 a.m., there was U.S. news, so I let it go a little longer. If it didn't trigger before 11 a.m., I was canceling it. It didn't trigger, I canceled the trade. I'm not looking to trade illiquid times. I'm not looking to trade when there's choppy price action, when there's not very strong momentum, when there's not very strong moves. I want to get in a trade that I think has a high chance of moving in the next period of time because that's why I'm trading, right? That's why I'm getting in that trade because I want it to move. Whether it stops me out or hits my take profit, I want it to move. I don't want to be sitting in a trade and uh, my trade not moving. Another reason for that is leverage. I trade US regulated brokers. I've traded overseas brokers that you can get 4,000 to one leverage. I just, um, I trust the withdrawal process. I trust the security. I trust the um, government funding backed for com companies that go under. Um, so I trade US regulated and I'm in the US. So it's easier for me to open an account with them. I have 50 to one leverage. If I have a pound trade open, it's going to be hard to open another trade. I mean, usually I can open two trades. Two trades is my limit open at a time unless one of them is risk-free or in profit. Um, but if I have a trade that I took in the Asian session and it just lingers around for 12 hours, that's 12 hours of that X amount of margin in my account that I can't use to open a trade. Let's say when London opens and I get a nice trade set up, um, that money is allocated somewhere else. And now I can't use it to take that trade that fits my plan in the right time. And also, you know, you avoid the trap moves, you avoid the choppy price action that stops you out, you get those clear, strong moves. And if you look at the statistics, um, you can see that the US and London sessions have the strongest moves. And that's when you want to be trading. Or let's say you're trading a, a news event. Let's pop over to this chart. I mean, to this uh, Forex factory. Let's say you're trading around the RBA rate statement tonight at 12.30 a.m. 12.30 a.m. is a ways before London opens in Eastern time this is. That's typically not a time I'm looking to trade unless I'm you know, loading up a pre-London trade, getting close to it. Um, but with an event like that, yeah, I know there's going to be people watching. I know there's going to be people trading. I know there's going to be volatility around that. So I'm going to be looking to trade that. But the, the time of day and the time you trade is going to have a huge factor on your profitability. And that is another thing you need to include in your probability to determine your uh, positions. Let me get to a couple questions here. When trading with the trend, what is the smallest time frame I trade? Smallest time frame I trade is the hourly, but when I'm trading the hourly, I'm trading it on the direction of the daily trend. So um, essentially, I use the daily chart and above for trend direction. And I'll trade in the direction of that trend on the smaller time frames. Uh, anything smaller than a daily trend, I don't like to trade. That's just what I personally tested. The daily is the most powerful, in my opinion, and uh, the cleanest. When you go into the weekly, yes, you get really powerful trends and all, but um, the weekly is going to be more so long term. I don't have the patience to trade that long term. Um, honestly, man, that stochastic, Sean. Um, that's a question that I don't even want to try to answer for you, man. Um, stochastics, not a tool that I've tested really very much. So uh, I prefer settings on tools that I've tested. If I was you, I would just go to the standard stochastic setting. Um, what is it, 721 or something like that? Maybe I'm thinking of RSI. Um, put it on the standard setting and test it. 
you know, go back in time, scroll back on your charts, go back in time, and let's say you're using your stochastics for uh, divergence. See how many times divergence occurred and price actually responded to it. See how many times divergence occurred and price didn't. You know, start testing it and getting a feel for yourself to see what works and doesn't work. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm a strong believer on the, these settings, these indicators at any setting has a use if you test it and use it properly. Um, so if that's how you say it, sorry if it's not. Which time frame are candlestick patterns best to look out on for? Um, that's another one that's not really any one answer. However, um, if you... The higher time frame you go to, typically the stronger the pattern is. Now there's candlestick patterns that are stronger than others. You've got engulfings, you've got uh, long wick, you know, dojis and, and uh, pin bars, your hammers and shooting stars. Um, that'll be stronger than others, but I particularly won't go lower than the four hour chart with candlestick patterns. I've tested it a lot on the hourly, uh, not so much 30 minute or 15 minute with candlestick patterns, but I've tested a lot on the hourly and did not find much success with it. So from my personal experience, the daily I like the most, backed by the second with the four hour. I will look, look on the weekly though. Um, uh, usually the weekly candlestick patterns will scare me more than anything. I'll be in an uptrend on the daily. I'll look at the weekly chart and it'll be a strong reversal candle on the weekly. On the daily, it's a beautiful setup, beautiful trend. And then I'm like, oh crap, this weekly chart's freaking me out. Uh, but yeah, the higher the time frames, typically the stronger the candlestick pattern, but I don't go below the four hour. And again, that's another thing to, I would just encourage you to test it, you know, build the strategy around X amount of candlestick patterns, try it out and see where they work. You can even try the same strategy on different uh, time frames and see how it goes. Daily is most psychological time frame for every trade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look across the board, the daily is going to be the closest watched. Um, the trading companies I've traded with, the, the number one point of analysis is always going to start on the daily. Um, so I think that the daily is the highest watched and maybe not the highest traded because, you know, a good amount of traders trade the hourly, four hour, intraday type stuff. But um, as far as analysis goes, trend direction, candlestick patterns, market, I mean, uh, yeah, structure, support resistance, trend lines, all that, Fibonacci levels, the daily is going to be very, very powerful. Something that I highly recommend everyone uses, even if you scalp. Uh, when backtesting, if you highlight support and resistance on the daily chart but are taking trades on the hourly, how do you backtest successfully without knowing trend direction? Let me see. If you highlight support and resistance on the daily chart, how do you backtest successfully? Um... Now that's kind of going to go down to, yeah, that's kind of going to go back to what you're using to backtest. Um, there are limitations with backtesting, unfortunately. Backtesting's come a long ways from what it used to be. It used to be people would print out charts, a hundred of them, and write with pencil on the charts and see how it worked. Now we can go back and look. However, there are still limitations. I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I know what you're saying here. Let's say you're going back in time. Let's just say you use this replay tool, right? That uh, TradingView has now. You can go back in time and basically go tick by tick. I don't know if, oops. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with this tool or not, but you can go back in time and you can essentially go tick by tick through TradingView and, it, and you can back test this way, right? Um, now, I think what you're trying to say is uh, what do you do if, you have zones on the daily, but you're trying to test it on the hourly because it's not always um, easy to know on the hourly. You can't just switch between the hourly and the daily to determine your trend. Um, so you're kind of just going with it. Is that what you're trying to say? Like if I'm back in time on the hourly chart, yeah. Um, so I know there are more expensive backtesting tools out there that you, I think, can switch between charts back in time. Um, actually that might not be true. I know there was one Forex tester three or two or something like that, that I tried before. I wasn't a big fan of it, but that's probably the most high tech one out there. The company I've traded with, um, for the past few years gave us a simulator tool that I used, but that one, again, you could not flip through time frames while back in time. So really what I took advantage of back testing for was I would break it down into specific things and back test that. 
a lot of my back testing was done for my um, take profit and stop loss strategies. You know, if I go to the hourly chart and I have, let's say, an hourly breakout strategy and I want to test stop losses and where to set them and how to determine them, I'll pick a strategy and I will um, take 100 trades of it on the simulator. Won't take too long. The hardest part is recording everything. Um, and then I'll go and see, you know, how many stopped out, how big the stops were and all. And then I'll do it again with a different strategy and I'll compare things of that nature, stop loss and take profits as well. I'll see which take profit strategy in the long run got me more pips, which one was hit easier. Um, also, you can do like I was just showing you with divergence. Say you want to test stochastics. Go back in time. If you're going to be using divergence on the four-hour chart, go back in time. Find as many divergence occurrences as you can. See how many of them worked out and didn't work out. Now you have a percentage to base off of. And you can go, okay, uh, you know, 50% of the time divergence worked when it occurred at a strong resistance and uptrend or some, some of that nature, you know. Um, but another thing that I would do is let's say I'm trading on the hourly chart. I'll go back over to this real quick. Let's say I'm trading on the hourly chart in the direction of the trend on the um, in the direction of the trend on the daily. One thing I'll do to just kind of help this, the odds in my favor even more is um, let's say I started at a random point and it looked like this. I would try to zoom out a little bit and be like, okay, you know what? Price is generally moving bottom left to top right. That's probably in an uptrend. I'm going to determine that in an uptrend. If I was at a point in time like we've been recently and it looks like this then I'd be like okay maybe we're not in a trend you know maybe this is just range bound so maybe I'll pick a different point in time to go back to where I can see all the way to the left like here if you're trading a breakout strategy in the hourly chart this would be a perfect place to test it you've got a high basing looking pattern consolidation you can zoom out and see you're in an uptrend okay that's where you'd test it right because you have a good chance that that's an uptrend on the daily when it looks like that Hopefully that helps, Beatrix. Let me know if not. Let's just take profits. I always have a problem with getting the most out of my trade. What fib level do you use to take, take profit example? I don't use fib extensions to take profits. I've tested them before, the Fibonacci extension tool. And uh, yeah, it's useful and it's cool and all, but um, I don't use Fibonacci. Uh, what I use to set my take profits, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into exact detail with, because again, that just wouldn't be fair for my students, but like, Let's say I trade pullbacks, right? If I'm entering this position here to go long, I like to use, let's say, the prior high as my take profit, right? So that is a nice, safe, achievable take profit within an uptrend. Um, market structure would be my best answer for you for how I determine a take profit. Now, there's two different kinds of take profits as well. I... Since I'm a trend trader, I like to let my trades run to try to, you know, take that next big move in the trend. So I'll have a half a position for one type of take profit, half for another. So my first position, I'll have a predetermined stop loss based off of structure, right? Uh, if I'm long, I'm going to look for the next major support, I mean, next major resistance zone. That'll be my first take profit. Then my second one will be a trailing profit. And let's say I'll, I'll if I'm in a long take profit one hit, Take profit two, I'll get out when the moving averages cross. Let's say I got long down here. First take profit was hit right here. Now the second take profit, I'll trail until the moving averages crossed. The moving averages crossed here. So I would have gotten out down here, right? So uh, there's a couple of different things for take profits that, um, you know, can kind of change around a little. But from my testing personally, I found market structure looking left as Jason Stapleton, who I always love to watch his videos when I was learning, says, um, use structure, right? Especially if you're trading pullbacks in an uptrend, you can use the prior swing high. If you're trading breakouts, maybe you can use the um, pattern that it broke out of and how you know that pattern works. If it's a flag pattern, use the flagpole. If it's a triangle, use the size of the triangle as a one-to-one -one move, things of that nature. Um, but my biggest thing that I could say, man, Clayton, uh, with take profits is test it. I know I've been saying that a lot for everything, but there are so many tools that we have our access to um, that we can take advantage of. Go into TradingView. It's free. Go back in time. 
take 15 breakout trades. It doesn't matter if it's exactly the same style you use. And um, set, determine. Now, market structure is kind of hard to test exactly back testing just because every trade is going to have different structure. But um, say you want to test, you know, a, a Fibonacci extension level. Test it out in, in historical price and see which one hits more often, right? See which one creates better results over time. So uh, I would say definitely go back and test it. Line chart sometimes I analyze weekly time frame for trend direction. Um, yeah, sometimes I'll use the line chart, so I'll just like peek at it to see what it's looking like. It, it's really telling me the same thing as a um, candlestick chart. Sometimes I, you know, I'll refine it a little bit for trend lines, but I'll switch back and forth between the line and the bar to make sure it lines up on both of them. Um, but the line. I don't, I'm not really a big believer in a line chart. I think that's another, just like an indicator type of deal. It's just showing me the same thing I'm already looking at with, with um, price action candlestick charts that it's just showing me a different version of it, different view of it, you know? It's like uh, looking at the same mountain from uh, one side or the other. I don't know. That was a stupid analogy, but it's just, it, to me, it's just the same thing. What else? Anyone else want to ask any other questions or anything while we're here? I'm going to stop this recording now.